All right. So I'm going to talk to you about today about um, how to turn an ORM into a platform. And uh, many of you might already be aware that uh, Prisma is an ORM. And um, just this transition of creating some sort of a new product, which is a data platform, comes with its own set of challenges and changes, whether they have to do around the organization, whether they have to do around the team workflows, or whether they have to do, of course, around the tech stack. So I'm going to talk about all of this in this presentation today. Just a quick introduction. I'm a product manager. I used to be a front-end developer in the past. I was working as a product manager at Contentful back in, in Berlin, and I've been working with Prisma as a product manager for the past one, one year. And because it's a remote company, they give me the opportunity to join from here, from Athens, Greece, where I'm located with my family. And um, for anyone who is not familiar with what Prisma is, I would like to explain what it is, but I think our developer advocate Mahmoud in our company does a great job in this video. So I'm going to play this very short one minute video. Prisma is an open source ORM that allows you to easily manage and interact with your database. It all starts with your Prisma schema, a place where you define your database models and relations using Prisma schema language. You can write your schema from scratch or generate it by introspecting an existing database. And when it's time to talk to your database, you'll use Prisma Client, an auto-generated, type-safe query builder where you think about your data, not SQL queries. And when your app needs to evolve, you'll use Prisma Migrate, which is Prisma Schema Migration Tool. All you need to do is update your Prisma Schema, run the Prisma Migrate command, name your migration, and you're done. Seriously, that's it. Finally, there's Prisma Studio, an admin UI to view and edit the data inside your database. There's even dark mode. Prisma currently supports PostgreSQL, MySQL, SQLite, and Microsoft SQL Server, and works inside any JavaScript or TypeScript environment with all of your favorite backend technologies. Prisma allows you to be more productive and ship your apps with confidence. For more info, go to prisma.io. So a quick note to myself, don't click around. I'm sharing a video from presentation. I think that's why you saw some small poses. So this was just um, in order to make a Prisma quick introduction a for uh, for what Prisma is for whoever is unfamiliar. So it's it's an ORM. If you you have used something like Active Record on Rails, that's basically very similar to what we do. So that was great. Um, I hope that was also clear. But I mentioned that this talks about turning an ORM into a platform. And the reason we're doing this is that there is a problem behind this, uh, this move. And uh, the problem is this question, basically. We, a lot of people ask us this question all the time. How do we make money? How does Prisma, is, how is Prisma sustainable as a business? And we also ask this internally a lot. We have been asking this um, inside for, for a couple of years. And there are many ways you can go about this. When you have an open source free offering as a company, uh, you can make money either by offering professional services or support like these uh, Linux distributions do. For them, of course, it's, uh, it makes sense to get customers to pay for these kinds of services because they're very deeply tied with a big enterprises, usually uh, technical infrastructure. So this makes sense for them, but not for us because we're not in the same use case. There is also another uh, case where you might have, you might have uh, some donations coming in. If you are, for example, Mozilla or, um, or, or Wikipedia, who live off from that, but this is not something also we, because we, we don't have such a huge appeal like this to organizations to a wide base of uh, users. What companies in our industry are doing, like uh, GitHub, like MongoDB, Heroku, and Elastic, just some examples, is that they they don't charge or they ask you to pay money as a user for the core product, but they build another product. They take a what we like to say product uh, based approach to this uh, problem. And um, what kind of product? If you're asking yourself, what kind of product would you build on top of your core offering? Um, this, is, this is a good example. So this is a video, a video of Adam Gross. He is the former CEO of Heroku. 
And uh, if you have access to the presentation, you can click on the link later afterwards and uh, watch the video. What Gross does here is he explains how Heroku went from, or actually how they, uh, they, they, they framed, how they divided their offerings so that they can cater to this uh, multi-step crowd. And in this video, he describes the core pillar of, of framing your free offering, which is mode one here. That is uh, this uh, free individual, this free tier for an individual developer. So let's say that you're a developer who is building an application. You might have used this .heroquap.com domain. This is uh, who they're targeting with this uh, free offering. Then there is, once you have more people contributing code to your application, to your code base, you're going to start asking for features like pipelines, like uh, CI, CD uh, de deployments, integrations. And then when it comes to mode three, uh, which is the big boss, it's the big money, it's, uh, it's, it's enterprise. It's not so much about uh, user-facing features and capabilities, but it's more about dim dimensions like uh, compliance and security and availability. These are pretty dull, if I can say, uh, features, but as, as a product team to build, but they are the most important for these kinds of uh, users. So if we were to apply this uh, thinking into Prisma, we would see the open source or I ORM sitting in this first column. This is what we currently offer to our users who are building, uh, who are happily building applications using this type safe uh, way to talk to their databases. And uh, once we start migrating our offering, expanding our offering as a company to, to a team that is building a, an application, a production application, then we start seeing something like uh, the data platform. And uh, I'm going to talk in a few minutes about this, about what the data platform is, and hopefully at some point, as Prisma in the future, we will have, we'll get to that uh, point. Um, yes, so the platform is uh, what we like calling uh, a Prisma or an application data platform. This is what we hope, uh, this is what we're currently building, and uh, we hope we'll accommodate for this uh, second and third column users. It's still in early access, so it is free. Uh, it's not yet a paid uh, product, uh, but at some point, of course, we want to change that. And this is the, the vision statement that we have. I'm not going to read it to you now, but there are some keywords uh, that are important here. We, we like to add this prefix, this application data platform, application to the data platform, because there are data platforms already. We have seen data platforms like lenses, for example, um, that are analytical data platforms. They cater for analytical use cases, uh, like you want to see, you want to send some metrics and uh, see what's happening inside these uh, services that manage your analytics. But we haven't seen anything around application. We have seen a lot of big companies like Facebook building their own data platforms internally and tools that help them uh, access data, uh, manage uh, access uh, control, and help them scale their applications. Uh, enabling teams, that's another keyword that is uh, interesting here. It's we don't want to offer the platform for just the sole user. We want to enable teams uh, to bring their applications on production and scale them, help them scale their applications. So this is, if we could, so the transition uh, of schematically in a, in a in architectural diagram, a very, very high level and maybe a bit outdated uh, architectural diagram. This is what we're hoping to do. Uh, usually a schema, a diagram helps more to convey a message. So let's say that you have in an enterprise context, you have an application, maybe you have many projects, many applications, um, maybe you have also plenty of um, data sources, you might have um, Postgres, you might have MongoDB, you might have not even databases. Data sources could also be other systems like a CMS or a customer data platform. And uh, there you have, yes, your, you have your projects that are accessing these uh, databases, data sources. What we are building and we aim to offer is um, first a data plane 
This is what we call as the runtime component. It's something that you would use in your application that your application would be using while it's being deployed on production or on other stages. And uh, this data plane would be connected to the, to the data sources, sometimes for the same application also, which would mean that uh, the client, as you use it now with Prisma and you can query one data source, you might be able to also query from the same client uh, from the same interface as a developer to many data sources and combine them into one theoretical data source, which you can already smell how, how hard it is uh, when it comes to security, when it comes to performance, the weakest link, the slowest database is going to, uh, actually your whole API is going to be as slow as your slow database and as insecure as your least secure database. So the data plane, needs to solve this, uh, take care of these concerns. And next to the data plane, uh, another part of this whole offering is the control plane, which is used to configure the, the data plane, but also to offer various uh, workflows, like giving you access to your data, giving you some analytics about your database, uh, giving you a data catalog. And uh, this is what we call as, the, as the, the, the Prisma, the application data platform. These two com main components, the runtime component here and the, the workflows component here are what we call as uh, the Prisma data platform. So mode one here, right? These green boxes, which are the ORM that you use in your applications and mode two and hopefully three here. So this was the high level schematic presentation of the architecture that we're thinking of uh, providing. It's serving sort of like a vision document for us. It's of course not prescriptive as in we have to build these features in the next five years, but it's a good indication of uh, where we want to be. It's kind of, it's a vision type. That's what we call this uh, internally. And it's kind of like this uh, in, a, in a less, it's a, in a more uh, schematic way, but in a less impressive way, it's very similar to these awkward videos that Facebook just launched about their metaverse. Um, this, these are also a vision type. This is uh, our version for what we want to build. So going through, doing a quick walkthrough to what the platform shows, which can also use, I will give the URL later if you want to use it, is uh, the data browser. And in the previous video that I showed, you, you might have seen that there was a local database uh, admin tool that we offered called Studio. We basically, when we first built this platform, the first step we took this sort of MVP approach, you know, this is a very used term, but it is what it is, it's the, it was the MVP. We repurposed this, uh, this studio thing. We even, like even this thing, in order to get this out fast, this is an iframe. So many of you front-end developers, they are in the crowd, might cringe hearing that. But yeah, this is a, this was an iframe which allowed us to get this same local application up and running fast on the, on the cloud. And it allows you to make changes to your database. So once you create a project in this data platform, you connect it to your own database, which is online, and then you can make changes. You can add data, you can delete data and, uh, it's a basic uh, admin UI tool. And you can invite your colleagues who will have different roles so you can make sure that someone can view but not edit and so on. It's a good first step to have an admin UI until you need your own, which you will need at some point, of course. Next, we have a REPL.it kind of uh, tool where you can uh, play around with some Prisma, Prisma queries online. So you can maybe see what the, 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 the client interface looks like with auto completion, like being in a native type safe TypeScript environment. Uh, it's useful when you get first get started with uh, Prisma via the platform. You can also get some data from your database. You can aggregate, you can do many things, or you can just try out some things. If you don't have the project locally checked out, you can test it online. You can maybe ask your colleague to try something out and then they can go on and uh, check this project out uh, locally. And um, what features I was 
I was presenting so far were around this left box of the control plane, and they were around workflows, uh, which don't sit in the critical path of the application. But this one, the data proxy, as we call it, is a feature that we offer now that sits right in the middle, right in front of your application, between your application and your database, actually, to be precise. And what we're trying to do with this is we want, at some point, once you install the data proxy in the future, we want to offer things like uh, caching, uh, like uh, security, many features that in order to offer them, your application needs to go through this data proxy. But for now, uh, what we have is that we're trying to solve this connection pooling problem. So if you have worked with any serverless applications and you wanted to speak to a, to talk to a database in the backend, you might have run into this connection pooling issues, uh, which uh, services tools like a PG Bouncer are trying to solve. Again, I'm going to let Mahmoud to explain what the connection pooling issue is. Once this goes at on. Prisma, we redefine the developer experience of working with databases with a next gen ORM. You write your data model in a human readable allowing anyone to quickly understand how your database is designed. You then get an auto-generated, type-safe query builder that you can use to read and write data to your database. And when your schema needs to evolve, you run a single command that auto-generates migrations for you. However, regardless of whether you use Prisma as your ORM, working with traditional server-based databases in a serverless environment, you run into an issue. Each serverless function opens a connection to the database. So during traffic spikes, you'll quickly exhaust the database's connection limit. This negatively impacts performance and leads to failed requests. That's why we've built the Prisma Data Proxy. It's a service that sits between your server and database and handles database connection management for you. It's currently in early access and we would love for you to try it out. To learn more, go to pris.ly slash data proxy. Yes, so... As you may have guessed, this is this data proxy feature is something that uh, because it sits in such a critical path of the application and uh, because it, it will be used later for um, for more advanced features, this is a feature that sits right into this um, uh, number two mode uh, of the teams deploying uh, production and scalable applications. I'm going to speak to talk about the tech stack now. There, I think there needs to be a mandatory tech stack slide in every presentation of a platform with the different logos. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to maybe offer some, to add some order to these logos. So this is the front end app, uh, which is an Next.js application. It's natural, naturally built uh, on React. It is tied with Tailwind uh, CSS, which again, I personally not a big fan of, but I understand that it's very good for fast iterations. And this is what we wanted, especially in the beginning. We host our components uh, of our still in progress uh, design system in a storybook. And uh, we connect this storybook uh, design, design components library with our application so we can use uh, the components directly uh, as uh, packages, as, as, comp as imported components. And uh, then this application uh, uses Relay in order to, oh, oh, that was not right. It uses Relay in order to speak to the, to the backend. And uh, the backend, no, I will get to the, to the backend uh, soon. So we, we use Relay in order to consume the GraphQL endpoint. And uh, the app is hosted uh, to Vercel. So we, we chose Vercel instead of Amazon or whatever other uh, hosting service, because first of its tight integration with uh, Next.js, and also because it was offering, it offers some great features for your workflows as a team, uh, like uh, preview deployments. So whenever you put up a, a PR, you create a new branch, you put a PR, and if you have connected Vercel with that, then it generates a preview deployment for this specific uh, uh, branch, and that's a great, a great tool for everyone in the team, but also for me as a product manager, when I don't have the project checked out locally to run it and test some code, I can just click on that and see what's happening, what the proposed change is. Uh, we also chose Next.js in order to get up and running quickly, but uh, we quickly came to see that even though it's a great tool to build front-end applications like uh, e-commerce websites or content news websites, 
uh, it's maybe not the best tool for building uh, admin UI interfaces and applications, basically. The backend application now, this is also hosted in Vercel and it's also in Next.js. And um, it might be weird that we have two applications. We actually kind of have two code bases, two, two applications in the same code base, uh, but it's a good thing that we have uh, we have a good packaging and deployment workflow with Vercel. It basically takes care of both the back end and the front end. So we took advantage of that and uh, we use that. Though we're not using the, the, the native back end functionality that uh, Next.js comes with, first because it's a, it's a REST application and also because we might want to sometime at some point uh, expose the GraphQL endpoint to maybe other services like our CLI. So we opted out to host, to create our own, to host our own server inside the Next.js application with Apollo. We're using uh, GraphQL Nexus, a tool that uh, allows you to programmatically build your GraphQL schema from your Prisma schema, because of course we're using Prisma internally uh, in our application to dog food our product. And uh, through Prisma, we're talking to, a, to an RDS PostgreSQL uh, instance. And the data platform is here. So if you have access to the presentation afterwards, you can just click to cloud.prism.io and have a look if you want. So now we'd like to speak about, to, uh, to, to say a couple of words about uh, how we work. Uh, as I said before, we are a remote company, which, uh, which means that we, we don't have a lot of overlap in our time zones. So we're not just remote in the same time zone, but we're remote across the entire world. We have people in our team, we have people in Europe and South Africa, and also in South America and Canada, which means that we have a very small overlap uh, in the team. And uh, that means that um, whenever we have a meeting, because we, we like saying that we are remote first, we're not remote friendly. Uh, whenever there is uh, some sort of a meeting, we always need to make sure that we write down things on Slack. Uh, we write an update so that then the rest of the team can read that. And uh, we make sure that everyone is uh, up to date. So that's like rule number one that we have in the team. Another thing that we used to do in the past, but we changed was that uh, we used to have bi-weekly sprints the very typical way of uh, working, but we kind of felt a bit, um, the team at least felt a bit constrained or maybe also stressed by this natural goal and the, the, the continuous goal setting and not making it maybe. And um, as we are still hiring for engineering managers, uh, we thought of instead of keeping pushing into improving this uh, workflow, maybe fall back into a more uh, flow-based Kanban setup. So what we have now is basically just a Kanban where we we build the to-do column in Kanban and we work on the items that are on top. And uh, how we do this, <coughs> pardon me, how we do this is uh, we have a, a weekly sync of two hours. So every, every week for two hours, we meet and uh, we, the entire team, that's um, one of the few synchronous meetings that we have, and we make sure that we then feed the items on the backlog, on the, not the backlog, on the on the to do column, or we remove some items, or we reorder some items. This means that even though we we this experiment is going well, even though we're happy with uh, with the Kanban flow and the weekly things, this whole process means that we are focusing very much on the weekly scale. It's, it's a very tactical uh, focus that we have. And we need as a team, as a product team, to also sometimes look a bit uh, on the cloud, right? We don't want to be just on the, on the ground level, but we also want to have a view on what's happening up here, what's happening not in the, in the, in the weekly scale, but what's going to come in two months or in one quarter. And uh, what are we going to build next? So that's why we have some monthly strategy meet, uh, meetings where also the CEO, uh, the VP of product and the VP of engineering are, are invited and the team can ask them questions and uh, they can answer um, 
about like what why do we do something uh, why do we have this architecture can we change that and so on that's always very useful to give the team um, a seat on the table basically right and also give them some ownership to what they're building which is very important in a product team uh, yes in terms of tooling uh, for our process we have plenty of tools, of course, but uh, three that stand out in our daily process are HIP, starting from left. HIP is our analytical uh, tool. Yeah, it's what we use to track events and of what people are doing in the platform. And uh, we have a very high level dashboard in HIP, which is following this pirate metrics, if you have heard this, uh, which is an acronym for AARRR, which is uh, acquisition, Activation, acquisition, activation, retention, refiller, and re revenue. And it's just a fancy, a list of fancy words uh, to describe how people are signing up your platform, how much they're coming back to it, how much money you're making. That is zero for us so far. And um, the way we use this tool is that we sit down with the team and uh, we see that, okay, we have issues in signing up. So we're going to focus in a project creation flow in the next three months in order to make sure that people don't drop out. And we keep having like a hockey stick growth in our signups. Uh, what we're actually doing now in, in the next uh, quarters is that we see that even though people sign up, they don't necessarily stick to the platform. So the activation and retention metrics are kind of um, not having the upward growth we want. So we're going to focus on building some features that will get people hopefully to come back after they sign up. So this is how this analytical tool is helping us guide uh, our features. Uh, another feature that we, actually another tool that we use is naturally uh, Notion. We have a lot of documents there in Notion, but one thing that we do differently from what we used to do in the past is that we have decoupled the backlog from the issue tracking tool, which is GitHub issues. Uh, we used to have a backlog of ideas, of bugs, of things that whenever someone, for example, in the team or somewhere in the company had an idea, they would just create an issue. And they would then expect that at some point this would be picked up, looked, groomed, uh, or acted upon basically. And we ended up having 200 items in the backlog for that. Uh, of course, this is due to lack of um, of uh, keeping track of that uh, due to our meeting uh, setup and cadence, uh, but also the difficulty to manage, filter, and sort information and expand on it also in GitHub when you are creating cards, but just cards like notes, uh, notes basically uh, is it was very limiting. And once you made a decision to turn the note into an issue, that was actually a very committing uh, moment. It's like it's suddenly there in your repo, which might also be public in some cases. Uh, so we didn't want to have this. And uh, we created this backlog table in Notion, where whenever someone has an idea, they just add it there. Uh, there is an owner. There is also some more details if they want, and then you can filter out. And this, by some setup and integrations, it feeds automatically into our weekly syncs uh, so that we can then kind of like this uh, feed into the, uh, the, the, the to-do call. And what we use now is uh, GitHub issues. This is the, the beta version of the GitHub issues. We are trying this out. It's great. It's a great tool. There are many things that are missing in my opinion. I would have uh, liked to have some swim lanes, for example, when we want to break down some uh, some feature work into separate tasks, uh, but they have some nice features also with the epics where you can list some uh, bullet points. I actually wanted to include the screenshot for that, but I forgot to do that. So the last bit of my presentation includes some challenges. Uh, this may be the most important part also. There are some challenges that we faced while building uh, the application so far as a team, uh, technical challenges. And the first problem that we had was um, naturally, like every platform uh, that is built, uh, faces uh, this problem of uh, performance. But in our case, it wasn't things like the backend is slow because the GraphQL endpoint takes so much to, to, to respond. 
which is also the case. Uh, it's not like uh, the front end application is slower because we have like a three megabyte, megabyte Tailwind uh, file. It's because of the nature of our feature. If you remember before, one of the features that we offer in the data platform is that we give the user the ability to edit data in their database. So now you have a topology of two regions, right? The first one is the Prisma topology. It's actually where Prisma is located. And then you have the user's location. Okay, so let's say, and uh, actually that's, that's uh, accurate. Um, the Prisma server, Versailles um, server where we have them now are in EU East, uh, the same as our RDS database. And uh, let's say that, for example, a user from Europe were to make a request and they wanted to edit a record in their database via our data platform. So what they would do is they would start with one hook, right? So this is the first one. And they would hit our Vercel uh, server and Vercel would then say, okay, let me speak to my database. So that's the second hope. Hopefully, um, thankfully it is in the same region, but then, the data, the database that we have uh, needs to returns back to the to the server because uh, there needs to be uh, there's a client instance binary that needs to be built the way that the client now works. You, there is a binary step uh, that builds in your machine currently when you use Prisma. So this also needs to happen uh, on a serverless context. And because it's serverless, you can't keep a binary file around. So you have to rebuild this every time. There are ways to of course improve that but for now we have this and then once the build the client is built then there's another hope again to speak to the um actually no that was inaccurate can i remove that yes i can so <laughs> there's another hope now that the client that is the client binary that is built uh, is speaking to the user's database which is in europe Again, right? So you can already see how hard that is. So then the user's database, which is the content, it means the contents of that table in the data browser, gets back to, it sends the, the, the data back to Vercel, right? And uh, that's the fifth hop. And then Vercel renders the entire thing and it serves it back to the user. It doesn't actually make the whole Earth round trip, but you get the point. It's, uh, it's six hops that need to happen. And uh, this is a complex problem to solve. It's, it has a lot of infrastructure concerns. Um, we are considering those some options currently and uh, for the near future. Um, Fly.io, you might have heard this service. They are a service who are promising to deploy servers close to your users. Uh, and they do this, um, they say with every database uh, type. PlanetScale and uh, CockroachDB are also services that do something similar, but PlanetScale is, is for MySQL, which is uh, built on top of Vitesse, and uh, CockroachDB is for uh, Postgres. So there are many services that are kind of picking up on this problem and are trying to solve it. And uh, so this was about the database layer, which would solve this bit. And when it comes to that bit, the location of the Prisma server, like the, 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 the Vercel files that we have so that they could be close to the user. Um, Vercel had this conference two weeks ago where they announced this new feature where your Vercel serverless application would be deployed at the edge, which means close to the user. So this should take care once we migrate to that which is a long process, of course, and very complex. This should take care of um, the, the, it should kill the extra hopes or the duration of the hopes uh, between the user and our database and server. Another problem, and that loader is a good opportunity for a sip of water. The other challenge that we have is uh, execution timeouts. And um, this is uh, a problem that happens because when someone is creating a project, they're going through the project creation flow, as we call it in the Prisma data platform, the mutation that saves the project and creates all the connected resources is uh, timing out. And um, it 
times out because Vercel gives you 15 seconds uh, before they time out your, your backend function or 30 seconds if you're in an enterprise setup. And the reason why our mutation is taking so long is because we are doing things like creating a GitHub repo and we need the GitHub repo so that the GitHub, the Prisma schema is stored somewhere in a file. And um, we're also creating a database for you so that when you create a project, you have a database ready with some test schema applied on top of it so you can quickly use the data platform. With Heroku, things were going fine. Um, but with Planet Scale, we tried a different provider, which is uh, Planet Scale. And because they are running their uh, provisioning uh, tasks in a background job, they take their time naturally, which is not a bad thing, actually. It's a smart thing they did. <laughs> this is what we are aiming to do, actually, now. We want to switch our uh, this, this function into a background task, uh, which is a very natural thing to do, of course. Uh, what we set out to do initially, and we had this uh, synchronous blocking uh, uh, function, was that we wanted to easily roll back when you failed in a step, uh, in, in a validation step throughout this four-step wizard. But um, this was not the best decision to make. We're now uh, deciding to move things uh, to the background. And this is going to solve the technical problem, uh, but it's it's going to introduce another problem uh, for the user. So let's say that you move this task, the saving task to the background. Okay, so now you have unblocked the user. They're not seeing this huge loader for a minute. They can start using the platform, but then what do they see? Once they go into the platform, but there's no database, you basically can't use half of the features. This means that the designer now needs to design this loading spinner or, or some sort of an empty or loading or fallback state uh, for the whole application in the components. <clears throat> and um, I, I like this example of the problem because it's a, it's a technical problem. It has a technical solution, but the implications of the solution go way beyond the technical boundaries. They, they, they reach out to the user experience. And this is a core example of um, what a tightly, tight uh, product team with tight feedback loops uh, should solve. They go back and forth with, uh, with, uh, with the solution and the designs and so on. And in terms of solutions, again, some services, uh, we're, we're currently looking at this problem, so we haven't decided, but there are services like temporal.io who claim to provide workflows for serverless applications. Uh, and of course, AWS Step Functions, they do that for the lambdas. <clears throat> and the last problem that we had was that logging was meh somehow in Vercel. So they were cutting, they were truncating the logs after some length for some reason. And also if you use the log sync like uh, Logflare, they would not guarantee to send everything, every log. So when a user came and they were asking you that, uh, they were telling you that something was broken, you would try to go into the functions, logs in Vercel and actually see nothing or some things would be missing. So instead of fighting this problem and trying to, to get this to work, we went around it and uh, we decided to try out uh, tracing and set up some telemetry across our serverless application. So you can understand how hard it is because with serverless, you don't have a common session uh, to group all these traces. So we used open telemetry, the open telemetry, open telemetry uh, framework to do that. And uh, then we used honeycomb.io as a service to, to, to visualize uh, these traces. So now whenever a user tells us in intercom that, hey, I can't save the project, we can go uh, look up for the user's ID, see what they did when they reported the problem and then see where they were, where the, 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 the functions were slow or they failed and then we can solve the problem accordingly. So that was the, the last problem that I, so then hopefully I got to answer this question today, if you have this in your minds, which is basically this, the way Prisma makes money or wants to make money is by offering a new product, which is a data platform, an application data platform on top of the order. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, I hope there are some questions uh, and I hope we have time because I might have run out of time. 
Shall we do this in English or Greek? Um, we can, I, I mean, since the, uh, the talk was in English, I say we do it in, in English as well. Thank you so much, Piro, for the talk. Um, amazing stuff and, you know, tough problem to crack. Um, about it. So people, you, you can use both the chat, but preferably the Q&A feature. And, um... Ah, cool. Shall we go with uh, the Q&A first? Yep. So there's a question from Stathis. Why not using some warm instances with some sort of or of AI to trigger an amount of instances? I will transfer this question to my uh, backend developer and I can get back to you. <laughs> uh, yes, unfortunately, when it comes to uh, ah, perfect. Strato. Uh, no, uh, I just said that you were going to answer that uh, live. So, you know, it was about okay. you, not me. Got it, got it. But yeah, sorry for uh, not being able to answer that. Okay, so that was... Not, but uh, if, if I were to guess, if I were to guess, I'd say that it's not a problem of uh, horizontal scaling, but of uh, edge location. But, you know, that's just a guess. Ah, was that a question around the first problem with the yeah. many hops? Yeah, so that is true. That is true. I would have a question, uh, a couple of those actually. Uh, I mean, until uh, you know, there's a new one on the Q and A. Um, have you ever thought of dealing? You know, since you're building a data platform dealing with a synthetic data problem. I mean, that's a, a, a really common problem. How do you, I mean, I'm building a new project. How do I feed the database with test data, uh, mock data, so that I can, you know, demo my app, um, test it out. So do you refer to just the, the seeding of the data or do you also mean the provisioning of data? Do you have the database Both. or do you also want to get? So these are two problems, uh, starting with the seeding we do plan to get into that at some point in the future. A good service to look at is Snaplet. Snaplet.dev, uh, I think it's built from some ex-developers from GitHub. And what it does is that it seeds your data and seeding is okay when you wanna do it in your local machine. Or actually, no, that's the problem. <laughs> it's uh, when you want to seed data, you, want just, you don't want to just seed random data like uh, Laura Mipsum and John Doe, but you want to probably have a copy of your production data. But then you have other problems. You don't want to get the full production data, which is, let's say one gigabyte in your local machine or other stages, but you want to, to, to anonymize also that data. You might be bound by GDPR concerns. So this is when I was saying before that Facebook is building some of these tools. This is exactly a tool they built internally, which copies part of your production so that you're always working when you're working locally in your dev environment, you're always looking at production data, but which are anonymized so that you don't get into trouble. So this is what snaplet.dev does. And we do uh, hope to build something like that. And when it comes to provisioning, that is maybe something that we're closer to doing, uh, hopefully in the future. We have this in our roadmap and we want to... So I, I spoke about this for cell deployments before. And uh, it's a great feature that works if you don't have databases, right? If you, or if you're using the same database, but you don't want to use the same database in between your preview deployments and your production, or you don't want to use the same pre preview database across all your preview deployments. So that is something we're also thinking of uh, having that uh, you, we will provision non-production grade databases for your preview deployments automatically uh, in your cell. That goes sense. well with the seeding, so provisioning yes. and then seeding, I guess. Yes, yeah. so it's a, we're starting with the, with the bicycle iteration first, we'll do the car later. Perfect. Thank you very much, Pio. I think we don't have too much time, to be honest. Um, it, 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 it was great to have you. Um, Prisma is a great tool. I think uh, a lot of people here are using it. So we look forward to your next steps as a company. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me.